Today, we head to Everything Hollywood Studios in Animal Kingdom. Stay tuned. Hello, hello, how to -ligans. Today, we will go over the best plan to make your day at Hollywood Studios and Animal Kingdom. I'll be telling you about must-see attractions broken down by age group and how to best utilize fast passes and also where to eat and drink at each park. But first, please hit that subscribe button and the bell to stay up to date on new content that I post. And also do comment below with any questions you have. Disney Hollywood Studios is the third of the Disney World parks. It opened on May 1st, 1989 as Disney MGM Studios. It is themed around everything Hollywood and it's actually less than half the size of Epcot at 135 acres. Did you know that when it first opened, it actually functioned as both a theme park and an operating production facility. They did away with the production aspect of the studio and focused more on attractions throughout the 2000s. And they're continuing this effort with the recently opened Toy Story Land, Galaxy's Edge, which is opening in 2019, and Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway opening in the Chinese theater in 2019 as well. This is all very, very exciting. However, it kind of means there's not a lot to do around Hollywood Studios now. Animal Kingdom is the baby of the Disney World family. It opened on Earth Day, April 22nd, 1998. It made me feel so old seeing the 20th anniversary banners hanging up at the park this time. So old! Anyway, it's way different than the other parks because along with having traditional attractions like the other parks do, it also is a functioning zoo. Because of the extensive animal habitats that Animal Kingdom has, it is the largest theme park in in the world at 580 acres. The park is dedicated to wildlife and nature conservation. Animal Kingdom added their newest land, Pandora, the world of Avatar in 2017. Pandora, of course, is now the most popular and crowded part of the park. I'll be covering Hollywood Studios' top five must-see attractions by age range, and then I will go to Animal Kingdom. A listing in Hollywood. Number one, must-see attractions for every age group at Hollywood Studios. One to six-year-olds. Number one, Alien Swirling Saucers. This is one of the newest rides in the new Toy Story Land. You sit in a spaceship that is being towed by one of the little green aliens from the Toy Stories franchise. Oh. As he makes turns, your spaceship will slide side to side. It was really cute, but you know, my girls didn't like it very much. I think that they might have been afraid that they were gonna fall out. I don't really know. Toy Story Land still has some bugs to work out because it's so new. When we went, only one of the two platforms was working and with a fast pass, we still had to wait about 15 minutes. Otherwise, it was a fun experience and I do believe that itty bitties will enjoy it. Number two, Muppet Vision 3D. With the new Muppet Baby show out on Disney Junior right now, I think this attraction is really gonna grow in popularity. My daughters happen to love the Muppets, so this was a must-see for us. It is a 3D show in a theater and therefore will require 3D glasses. One of my daughters would wear the glasses, one of them wouldn't. I especially like that this one is indoors and you get to sit down and relax. Number three, Toy Story Mania. It's a a cute ride. Very similar to Buzz Lightyear's Space Ranger Spin at Magic Kingdom. You, as with the other ride, are in a cart that has two blasters mounted to the front. It is themed though like an old-fashioned midway game from a carnival or a fair. There are screens you fire your blaster at and fake chips fly toward the Toy Story targets on your screen. You can compete with your cart buddy for a high score. I think that kids from one to three will have a little bit of difficulty aiming the blasters and so that's why it ended up lower on my list. Number four, Slinky Dog Dash. This is a brand new junior coaster 
in the Toy Story Land. It has a minimum height requirement of 38 inches, making it a little bit more accessible for this age range. Like the Barnstormer at Magic Kingdom, it is a very fast ride, and it's a really good one to start out if you've never ridden a roller coaster before, or if you have someone that's a little bit afraid of roller coasters. My complaint about Toy Story Land, and this is just small, but because you are supposed to feel like a toy in Andy's backyard, there are no trees and there's very little shade in sight. It got so hot from us walking from the entrance of Toy Story Land back to the alien saucer spin that my phone actually shut off because it was so hot. Let that one sink in. Number five, Star Tours, the adventures continue. It's an indoor 3D motion simulator ride that is obviously Star Wars themed. You are in the cabin of a Star Tours spaceship with C-3PO as your captain. I won't give any more of the plot away, but this one's a lot of fun. I didn't put it higher on my list simply because this ride is not suitable for riders under 40 inches. Now for the seven to 13 year olds. Number one, Rock and Roller Coaster, starring Aerosmith. I love this ride. It's an indoor coaster and it goes fast. At the very beginning of the ride, it goes from zero to 57 miles per hour in 2.8 seconds. The story for the ride is pretty interesting too. While in the queue, you go into a recording studio where legendary Aerosmith are finishing up a recording session. Their manager comes in to usher them out the door for the concert that they're almost late for. Oh no, but wait. Steven Tyler can't forget about us, the adoring fans. Steven Tyler is way too nice to do that. No, Steven Tyler wants to give all of us backstage passes to the concert that we're about to miss and tells his manager to hook us up with a super speedy stretch limo. But will we be able to rush through Los Angeles fast enough to get there on time? I bet it was starting to get annoying with me saying Steven Tyler as much as I did. Steven Tyler. Number two, the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. Er, 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 er. I love slash hate this ride. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you the whole story about this one in a sec, but I wanna explain why this one did not get my top booking for this age range, and that is because it's scary. It's a big old tower of terror. The Twilight Zone theme is creepy. It's an abandoned hotel. Oh yeah, it's also a possessed elevator that drops you 130 feet at 39 miles per hour. Might be a little intense for your seven or eight year old. Okay, now for the backstory. You enter the Hollywood Tower Hotel and you realize that it had been abandoned quite suddenly and no one had been there for several years. In the queue, you walk past the lobby to a bank of dilapidated elevators that read out of order. A bellhop tells you your room is not ready yet and ushers you into a library where you see several ancient books, artifacts from the Twilight Zone, and this really old television set. Just then, a thunderclap and the power goes out. The old TV flickers, the only thing on in the room, and begins playing the opening to the Twilight Zone. Rod Serling, the original host of the Twilight Zone, begins to tell you the story of five people staying at the Hollywood Tower Hotel on a night in 1939, just like this. These five people were traveling on the elevator when lightning struck the building, causing the elevator to crash 13 stories and the people inside to vanish. AKA die on impact. And stay around to haunt the hotel. Ooh. The ride is inspired by the real Hollywood Tower Apartments, which is rumored to be haunted. Number three, Star Tours, the adventures continue. This will be even more fun for this age group because they can enjoy it more than say a three-year-old. Most likely a child in this age range will have seen the Star Wars films and therefore will connect with the story a little bit better. Also, there are Jedi training trials of the temple shows outside of the attraction every couple hours. Definitely a must see. Number four, Slinky Dog Dash. 
It's new. It's one of two roller coasters in the entire park. Even if your kid can handle rock and roller coaster, this one's still fun. Number five, Toy Story Mania. This age range, like with Buzz Lightyear's Space Ranger Spin at Magic Kingdom, will enjoy this a little bit more than the younger kids. They have better eye-hand coordination from playing all them fidget games. 14 and up. Number one, the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. I spent way too long talking about this one last time I mentioned it, so I'll just give you a random fact. As you board the elevator, look to the left-hand side. You'll see an inspection certificate dated October 31st, 1939 and signed by Codwallader. This was a character from the original Twilight Zone episode, Escape Clause, that was later revealed to be the devil. The inspection certificate's number is 10259, which celebrates the first episode of the Twilight Zone series. Number two, Rock and Roller Coaster starring Aerosmith. The one and two spots for this age group are really the only thrill rides in the park until Maybe Galaxy's Edge opens. Number three, Star Tours The Adventures Continue. This ride is great for any Star Wars fan. In fact, this entire park is great for any Star Wars fan. My husband. Even before Galaxy's Edge is finished, they have tons here so that you can immerse yourself in the Star Wars world. Number four, Slinky Dog Dash. I'm only really including this on the 14 and up because it's new. I don't know if I'd have it on here otherwise. Number five, the Star Wars Launch Bay and Theater. Okay, there's kind of a shortage of actual attractions at Disney's Hollywood Studios, hence the top five as opposed to the top 10. And I didn't want the seven to 13 and 14 and up lists to be exactly the same. So I'm putting this in here. My husband, Mike, loved it. He's a huge Star Wars fan and the entire experience took about 45 minutes. So that's a good time to enjoy the AC at least. This interactive walkthrough features actual props from Star Wars movies, a chance to meet Kylo Ren, BB-8, and Chewbacca for photos, and also a theater showing Rogue One, a Star Wars story. They also have an entire store dedicated to nothing but Star Wars merch, and they even sell Skywalker's Vineyard wine. Okay, I wanna go back to when I said that the park is light on attractions. They still are, but they don't count any stage show as an attraction. Disney considers any show to be entertainment. Available, there is The Voyage of the Little Mermaid, Beauty and Beast live on stage, For the First Time in Forever, a Frozen sing-along celebration, Indiana Jones Epic Stunt Spectacular, Star Wars The Galaxy Far, Far Away, and of course, Fantasmic, being king of the jungle. Number one, must see attractions for every age group at Animal Kingdom. One to six year olds. Number one, Triceratops Spin. Think Dumbo, but instead of a flying elephant, it's a flying Triceratops, which makes about as much sense as a flying elephant. The dinos are nice and colorful. You can raise the car to go up or down. Your itty bitties are gonna love it. And the wait for the ride is never long, ever. Number two, the boneyard. I would usually put a ride before a playground, but this one is awesome. It has a ton for kids to do. There are some areas geared toward toddlers. There are some areas geared toward big kids. There are benches in the shade for mom and dad. They have a cast member at the front of it so that your youngster can't escape. And my girl's personal favorite, the dig a massive sandbox full of tiny little pebbles called Texas grit that don't stick to your kids as much as regular sand will. The playground is two separate areas connected with the sky bridge over the entrance of Dinoland USA. How cool is that? And the jungle gym. Yeah, 
It's three stories tall. Number three, Kilimanjaro Safaris. This one ride could fit the entire Magic Kingdom inside of it. You are loaded into actual safari jeeps and given a tour of the expansive East African habitats. The driver is going to point out the animals as you go. The animals on the safari include Okapi, Greater Kudu, Sable Antelope, Blue Wildebeest, Bontabok, Common Eland, and Kolwatuzi, Mandaral, Scimitar Oryx, Bongo, that one sounds funny, Yellow Backed Dukier, not spelled like you're thinking, Waterbuck, Grant's Zebra, Black Rhinoceros, White Rhinoceros, Hippopotamus, a lot of usses, Nell Crocodile, Reticulated Giraffe, Maasai Giraffe, Warthog, Cheetah, African Elephant, Lion, Adax, Spotted Hyena, and African Wild Dog. Whew, that's a lot. There are pictures of them inside your Jeep, so you're going to remember what they look like when you're on the safari. Number four, Navi River Journey. This is one of the new attractions in Pandora, the world of Avatar, the new land that's based on the film Avatar. Even if you don't know about the film or like it, this is a nice ride. It's a dark, which means indoor boat ride that travels through the river of Kazvapan in Pandora. Disney pulled out all the stops on this one. It features one of the most realistic and advanced audio animatronics ever built. It also has tons of screen projections layered with traditional set pieces. It's peaceful, it's colorful, it's not at all scary, and therefore it's a perfect choice. Number five, Primeval Whirl. I put this last on my list only because the older kids are going to be the only ones that can enjoy it because of the height restriction of 48 inches. It definitely should be a ride you visit though for those four to six. It's actually a spinning roller coaster, which means it has cars that spin around while traveling on the roller coaster track. It is themed to time travel and the Big Bang, believed to cause the extinction of the dinosaurs. It's in the Chester and Hester's Dino-Rama in Dinoland, USA. It has a very retro carnival or fair feel to it. Definitely a lot of fun. Now for the seven to 13 year olds. Number one, Expedition Everest, Legend of the Forbidden Mountain. Forbidden Mountain. Okay, this is my favorite ride at Animal Kingdom. It's themed around a Yeti who protects the Forbidden Mountain near Everest that you're currently on. You depart from Circa Zong Village on a train. You pass through a ransacked temple with murals of the Yeti, warning you that the mountain belongs to him. You enter a cave and the train comes to a halt and you see mangled tracks ahead of you. Obviously the handiwork of the Yeti. Then your train begins to accelerate, but backwards. Down through the mountain you travel until you come to another stop. You see a bright light ahead of you. No, not that kind of bright light. You see the shadow of the Yeti ripping another piece of the track apart like it's spaghetti. Your train flies forward this time down an 80 foot drop before going through a 250 degree turn. You hear the roars of the angry Yeti, but you keep going. Frantic to escape. Your train drops through a cave one last time where the Yeti reaches out to grab you. You barely get past him and return to the train station. Lucky to be alive. Sorry, that was a little dramatic, wasn't it? Number two, Avatar, Flight of Passage. This is the hottest ride at Animal Kingdom right now. It is part of the new world Pandora, the world of Avatar, part of the park. It's a motion simulation ride. Why didn't it get the number one spot on my list, do you ask? Eh, because since it's so new, there's never been a wait time under 90 minutes. And it's usually impossible to get a fast pass for this, especially only 30 days out. The story for this ride goes something like this. The humans and the Na'vi are attempting to restore the Banshee population after the ruthless mining tactics of the Resources Development Administration several generations ago. Alpha Centauri Expeditions, or ACE, 
has reactivated the Avatar program through the Pandora Conservation Initiatives Organization as a way to research the Banshees. You'll be taking part of the Navi tribal coming of age by riding the Banshee. You are assigned your avatar and then you take flight. Think Soren, but over the Valley of Moara in Pandora and more motion. Number three, dinosaur. What kid doesn't think dinosaurs are cool? It's housed in the Dino Institute. Before entering the loading area, you are shown a brief film where Dr. Marsh explains to you that you're gonna be able to go back and see the dinosaurs for yourself with your time rover. You are then transferred in the video to the control center where you're introduced to Dr. Seeker. Seeker skips the safety briefing to tell you that he wants you to go on a mission for him to save an iguanodon from extinction instead of the scheduled tour that you're supposed to take. He's put a tracker on the iguanodon so that you can find him and bring him back because bringing a dinosaur back to 2018 isn't a bad idea at all. Has this guy never seen Jurassic Park? I don't want to spoil the plot for you on this one. I will say that you go back to the late Cretaceous period, minutes before the Big Bang, extincted the dinosaurs. Number four, Collie River Rapids. I'm not the biggest fan of attractions where you get wet unless it's like a really, really hot day. This is a pretty standard river rapids ride in the Asia part of the park. It is themed as a rafting expedition down the Chakranadi River. In the queue, you wind through temples and shops. You arrive at the Kali Rapids Expedition Office. They explain in the video that you're gonna to be touring the area. But then, as you're about to leave, you hear on the radio that there are illegal loggers dangerously close to the river. What's that? Something doesn't go according to plan at a Disney ride? Never! Again, I'm not gonna spoil the story, but yeah. Kinda seems like things go on a rise pretty standard for Disney. Number five, Primeval Whirl. This is still a really neat ride for this age range. Better than the little ones because obviously more children will be tall enough to ride it. I really like the theming in Dinoland USA. It might be my favorite part of the park. 14 and up. Number one, Avatar, Flat of Passage. Okay, I'm just gonna say, of course this is the top pick. It's new, it's really cool, and it's based on an incredibly popular movie. Number two, Expedition Everest, Legend of the Forbidden Mountain. Since we've already gone into this one with a lot of detail, I'll just give you some cool facts. It holds the Guinness World Record for most expensive coaster ever built, costing Disney a cool $100 million to make. Also, it's the tallest artificial mountain in any Disney park worldwide, measuring 199 feet and six inches. Exactly six inches taller than the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror and six inches shorter than Federal Aviation Guidelines requirements to put a red light beacon on top of it. Number three, dinosaur. Again, trivia time. Imagineers, the engineers of Disney actually invented a dinosaur for the ride. It's based off of the real life Carnotaur dino, but they wanted to change the look of it a little bit. They named their creation Carnotaurus Robustus Floridana, which translates to stout meat bull from Florida. I love that. Meat bull is my new name for people I think are stupid. Number four, Navi River Journey. I basically don't have anything new to say about the two new rides that opened up in Pandora, the world of Avatar recently. The good thing about this ride is how calm and peaceful it is. It's a great way for people who might get overly stimulated to still enjoy Pandora without having to ride the flashier Avatar Flight of Passage. Number five, Kilimanjaro Safaris. If you're a real shutter bug, then this one should be really nice for you. You can get some really great pics with how close the animals are to your Jeep. Fun fact, since the park opened in 1998, Eight southern white rhino babies have been born in the park. With an estimated population of 19,600 to 21,000, 
they're considered near threatened. Okay, Animal Kingdom has a lot to do, but on Disney's official website, they've listed a lot of things as attractions that I don't really think classify. They're still cool, so I recommend you go to them, but it's not really an attraction so much as a walking tour of a zoo. Walking trails include the Discovery Island Trails, Gorilla Falls Exploration Trail, the Maharaja Jungle Trek, and the Oasis Exhibits. Number two, maximizing Fast Pass at Hollywood Studios and Animal Kingdom. A Fast Pass is Disney's system for reserving a spot at certain attractions. You have an hour window that you choose and you come back during that hour and you don't have to wait in line or if you do, it's a very short line. I will be telling you where the Fast Pass kiosks are in the park and a little bit of strategy on how to use them. Before you ever arrive at any park, you can book up to three Fast Passes per day. If you are staying at a Walt Disney World Resort, you can do this 60 days in advance. Everyone who holds an admission ticket to either park will be able to do this 30 days in advance. Another little perk I mentioned in my video about booking a Walt Disney World vacation. Seen here? Now, I know what you're thinking. I told you about five must-see attractions, but you can only book three fast passes. This is where the strategy comes in. Rule number one, no person can have fast passes that overlap. So in other words, you can't have a fast pass from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m and a fast pass from 9.55 to 10.55 a.m. For the attractions that you really wanna see, try and get the first fast pass in the morning that you can. Then book the rest of them as close to that fast pass window as possible. You do this because of rule number two. Once you have used or your three fast passes have expired, you can get more. This is one at a time though. Book your fast passes early enough that you can get more, but also carve a path through the park so you're not backtracking. These are some of the attractions you should definitely get a fast pass for. Slinky Dog Dash, Alien Swirling Saucers, Toy Story Mania, Rock and Roller Coaster, and Fantasmic. Now these are attractions that rarely, if ever, need fast passes. Voyage of the Little Mermaid. For the first time in forever, a frozen sing-along celebration. Muppet Vision 3D. And Beauty and the Beast live on stage. These are attractions that could go either way. Star Tours, The Adventures Continue, The Twilight Zone, Tower of Terror, and Indiana Jones, Epic Stunt Spectacular. Nothing about these lists is hard and fast, so general crowd levels will affect it. I'm just trying to tell you what the most popular fast passes are so you don't waste them. Now to where you can get more fast passes once you've used your first three. Option one is to download the My Disney Experience app. So yeah, you can automatically get fast passes that will transfer to your Magic Band. You can also go to fast pass kiosks throughout the park. Hollywood Boulevard at the corner of Hollywood and Sunset. Sunset Boulevard at the split between Rock and Roller Coaster and Tower of Terror. And Pixar Place just to the right of the Toy Story Mania entrance. Now for Animal Kingdom. These are attractions you should definitely try to get fast passes for. Avatar Flight of Passage, Navi River Journey, Expedition Everest, Legend of the Forbidden Mountain, Kilimanjaro Safaris, and Rivers of Light. Now these are the attractions that rarely, if ever, require a fast pass. Festival of the Lion King, Finding Nemo the Musical, It's Tough to Be a Bug, and Up a Great Bird Adventure. These are the attractions that could go either way. Dinosaur, Meet Favorite Disney Pals at Adventurer's Outpost, and Primeval Whirl. These are the Fast Pass kiosks located throughout the park. Discovery Island near the Island Mercantile Store, Asia near the entrance to Kali River Rapids, and Africa near the entrance to the Dawa Bar and the Tusker House Restaurant. Number three, where to eat at Hollywood Studios and Animal Kingdom. Okay, I'm going to break up the dining by the type of service and I'll also tell you what I would get from there. First up, Hollywood Studios, the Baseline Tap House, California Cheese and Charcuterie Plate, 
This is a beautiful option that feels way fancier than what you would normally get at a theme park. It is served with Toma Farmstead cheese, Point Reyes Original Blue Cheese, Laura Chanel Sonoma Goat Cheese, Chorizo, Calabresa Salami, Grapes, Stone Ground Mustard, Tiny Pickles, Pearl Onion, and Toasted Baguette Slices. Woody's Lunchbox, the Grilled Three Cheese Sandwich. This is such a childhood favorite that they've actually been able to make appeal to grown-ups too. It comes with cheddar, provolone, and cheddar cream cheese. And they take this even further by grilling it in garlic butter sauce and providing a cup of tomato bisque for dipping. Hollywood Scoops, Apple Crisp a la mode. This is so good. It is served with a crumbly, yummy streusel and served piping hot with vanilla soft serve. Dockside Diner, Carolina all beef footlong hot dog. This is a pretty standard thing to have where I live in the South. It's definitely worth a try if you've never had this combo flavors. Oasis Canteen Funnel Cake. I haven't told you to get a funnel cake anywhere yet, so here it is. Rosie's All-American Cafe, the fried green tomato sandwich. This is a very surprising sandwich. It was absolutely delicious. It includes arugula, pepper jack cheese, a slice of a fresh red tomato, and some sort of aioli on a ciabatta bun. Backlot Express, dark side chicken and waffles. This isn't the tastiest chicken and waffles I've ever had, but the little waffles are mini waffles with Darth Vader on them. So cool for a Star Wars fan. Fairfax Fair, the El Pastor pulled pork sandwich. This is one of the most flavorful pulled pork sandwiches available at Disney World. It's topped with sauteed onions and peppers and comes with plantain, which is just delicious. ABC Commissary, the Happy Days Cocktail. This will make you very happy. It tastes like a tropical paradise. It comes with Parrot Bay Coconut Rum, Melon Liqueur, Banana Liqueur, Grenadine, and Orange and Pineapple Juices. Cantina Eddie's Toy Story Cupcake. Ugh, this one kinda got on the list by default. There are only like five of this type of restaurant in Hollywood Studios. The Hollywood Brown Derby, famous Cobb salad. The real Hollywood Brown Derby invented my first and second choices on this list. As the story goes, owner Robert Cobb raided the fridge at the restaurant late one night to put together a midnight snack for theater magnate Sid Grauman of Grauman's Chinese Theater. He chopped up a little bit of lettuce, leftover bacon, egg, avocado, blue cheese, turkey, and whatever else he could find in the kitchen. He chopped it all up, made his own house dressing, and then threw it all in a bowl together. Cobb's famous salad became an instant hit when Sid came back the very next day to order it again. The Hollywood Brown Derby Lounge, mini grapefruit cake. The story goes that Luella Parsons, the most powerful gossip columnist in Hollywood at the time, complained to Cobb that all of his desserts were too fattening. Cobb quickly told his chef to throw some grapefruit on something because everyone knows it's slimming. So the chef invented his grapefruit cake with layers of cream cheese frosting, which are anything but healthy. The Hollywood and Vine Character Buffet. This is normally a Disney Junior Character Buffet, and so it wouldn't really appeal to me. But both times that we have gone, it's been around Halloween. And by around Halloween, I mean Disney starts putting up Halloween decorations in August. So therefore, because it's around Halloween, it is Minnie's Character Buffet. They have Mickey, Minnie, Donald, Goofy, and Daisy. It's honestly one of my favorite character meals. The 50s Primetime Cafe, Grandma's Chicken Pot Pie. This is such a comfort food, and this version of it is amazing. The pot pie is a creamy, cheesy blend of chicken, mushrooms, onions, celery, carrots, and peas, all topped with 
flaky pastries shaped like little Mickey heads. The Sci-Fi Dine-In Theater Restaurant, the Drive-In Barbecue Burger. Their signature blended beef topped with barbecue sauce, bacon, cheddar cheese, fried jalapeno and onion straws on a brioche bun. Now for my top picks at Animal Kingdom and what I would order there. Trilo Bites, the Smoky Bones Chocolate Shake. This is an adult shake that comes spiked with bourbon and garnished with whipped cream and candied bacon. Here are some pics of us enjoying it. Mike thought that this was so good that he raved about it from all the way from Dinoland USA to the parking lot. Pongu Pongu Night Blossom Drink. This is a non-alcoholic drink, so it's perfect for everyone. It is a layered apple and desert pear slush topped with passion fruit flavored boba balls. Boba ball, boba ball. Which are kind of similar to Bubble Tea's tapioca pearls. However, they're filled with fruit juice, so they kind of pop in your mouth. Mr. Kamal's Seasoned Fries. These are one of my favorite snacks to get at Animal Kingdom. Fresh, hot, crispy french fries topped with tzatziki sauce and a sriracha ketchup. They have a kick, but they're still refreshing. The Dawa Bar Lost on Safari Cocktail. This is a refreshing fruity drink that will make you not feel overserved, as we call it in my family. It is Star African Rum, Captain Morgan Original Spiced Rum, and Panjani Punch, which is a mixture of fruit juices. The Yak and Yeti's Local Food Cafes, the Mini Mango Pie. This is very reminiscent of like a key lime pie, so if you like that flavor, you're really gonna enjoy this. It has a graham cracker crust that's just perfect, and the tartness of the mango pairs really well. The Satuli Canteen Cheeseburger Stuffed Pods Bao Buns. Bao Bao Bun? Stuffed with ground beef, cheese, mustard, ketchup, and even pickle. They're soft, but not too moist. The Harambe Market Leopard's Eye. This bright neon green drink gets its color from the Bebo soda it's made from. It is a frozen slush drink and it is spiked with Snow Leopard brand vodka. A nice refreshing drink to have on a really hot day. Restaurantosaurus, the chili cheese fries. This is what the Disney food blog calls plastic cheese, which is liquid cheese, atop wonderful delicious meaty chili that's sitting aboard delicious hot crispy french fries. My second favorite fries in all of Animal Kingdom, Flame Tree Barbecue any of the barbecue. They definitely have some really nice barbecue dishes that you can smell from 200 feet away and so you're naturally pulled in. Pizza Fari Sausage and Pepperoni Pizza. Uh, I know it's not that unique of a choice, but this is a decently solid pizza and like any good pizza, when you reheat it the next day, it still tastes okay. Tusker House Restaurant Character Buffet. This buffet is nice. It's mostly exotic foods that they have, which means a lot of curry, but still very good. The thing you go for though is the characters. You will meet Safari Mickey, Donald, Daisy, and Goofy. The Yak and Yeti Boktapur Duck. I love duck, and so this is naturally my top choice for this restaurant. The duck is glazed with a sweet sauce that is kind of reminiscent of a St. Louis style barbecue sauce. It comes with perfectly steamed white rice and some delicious veggies. The Nomad Lounge, smoked Kobe style brisket poutine. I like including the lounges that are attached to these restaurants that are hoity-toity because it may be an easier and cheaper way for you to get the same food without all the hassle. This is the lounge to Tiffin's, which is very upscale and very expensive. This seems like an odd choice because poutine hails from Canada, which is not nearly as exotic as the rest of Animal Kingdom. However, it's perfect. The brisket is so flavorful. The house-made mozzarella is ooey, gooey, and wonderful. All in all, I think it might be the best poutine in all of Disneydom. Tiffin's Restaurant, Kamo Ramen. I'm sorry, it's a duck dish again. I'm not sorry.
This isn't your grocery store ramen. It is so good. It comes with fresh house-made ramen noodles, a soft poached egg, duck confit, alba mushrooms, chili lime cashews, all in a delicious spiced coconut broth. Rainforest Cafe, the Korean spicy stir-fry chicken. This is another one that ended up on the list kind of by default. I'm not the biggest fan of Rainforest Cafe because there are so many an Animal Kingdom exclusive restaurants available and there are Rainforest Cafes all over the country. But, you know, the atmosphere is fun. This dish comes with broccoli, carrots, a Korean barbecue sauce, chicken, mandarin oranges, peppers, fried wontons, onions, and sesame seeds over steamed rice. Okay, I wanted to kind of steer clear from another food challenge, so your special challenge for Hollywood Studios is a Star Wars photo challenge. Your terms, if you choose to accept this mission, are to go to the Star Wars launch bay and find a rarely noticed secret. There's a closet full of several very carefully disguised Star Wars film props. Snap a pic and try to name which film that the item comes from. Now, for Animal Kingdom, of course, I have an animal-themed challenge. Your objective is to count the total number of animals carved into the Tree of Life. Disney will say that there's over 300, but others have said it's actually over 325. How many do you think you can find? Let me know in the comments how many you end up finding. Good luck to everyone up to the challenges. I know that was a lot of information and hopefully it will help make your day at Hollywood Studios and Animal Kingdom even better. Thank you so much for watching. Check back every Tuesday and be sure to become a How To Again by subscribing below. Click the bell for notifications when I post new content and also make sure to comment below and introduce yourself and let me know what you'd like to see next. Thanks for stopping by.